thank you. Um, first thing I'm going to do is ask a question because um, I know a lot of people aren't really familiar with the stuff that I work on. Um, how many of you actually know what a herbarium is and have been into a herbarium? Oh, that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, that makes life easier. Um, so, first of all, um, where I work, I work at the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. And uh, most people, when they go there, are most familiar with the living collections. Um, that's what most people see when they go. Um, but there is this white building um, in the background there, and that's the building that holds um, two of the national collections that are held um, at the Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. Um, that is the, the national collection of the <coughs> botanical and horticultural literature, um, which is held in the Library and Archive. And there's the, um, the herbarium, which is basically the preserved collections. So in these, uh, the herbarium is on the top two floors of the building. And um, inside all these grey cabinets, essentially what's happened is people have travelled around the world. They've brought back parts of environments from all over. That's like savannas, tropical rainforests, peat bog. All of these parts of this environment have been brought back together in one place and are held in these grey cabinets. And, and it gives people this fantastic opportunity to study biodiversity very easily and very efficiently in one place, which is fine, if, if obviously, if you're um, in the building itself, um, working with the specimens. So the collections that we hold, they date back to 1697. So that's an incredibly rich resource over hundreds of years, these things have been collected. Um, around the world, it's estimated that um, more than 1.2 billion natural history specimens in collections around the world. Um, of these, about 300 million estimated are herbarium collections, and we hold 3 million of those. Um, as you can see, they're, they're held in these... Um, most of them are these sheets, flat sheets. Um, we do also have a, some material that's held in spirit, in bottles, but most of our collections are in these flat sheets that you can see here, um, and that makes things easier, as you'll see later. So as I say, we've got three million specimens over, um, over 300 years of collecting, but that collection is still happening. We're a very active um, institute, and we accession between 10 and 30,000 specimens each year. So there's, there's a large number still coming in. So the primary function of the collections is for taxonomic research. That was why they were generally collected in the first place. Um, and this is to give us um, some kind of handle on the biodiversity around the world um, and allow people to study it. Um, in so on top of that, um, we're finding now that they're being used for a lot of other kinds of research uh, um, more widely. So that could be climate change, it could be phenology, it could be um, art. I mean, we've got artists coming in using their collections. There's a much wider group of people starting to use the collections. Um, but most of the collections are, are non-electronic, and the data are generally held on labels on the specimen. So you'll see in the bottom right, the specimen there, there's a label and that's where the data are held. And these um, data are therefore not accessible away from the specimen. So you have to be with the specimen. We do send specimens out on loan um, to other researchers around the world, but there's a risk to that. These um, specimens are fragile, so we, we try to limit that as much as we can. So therefore, um, the idea of making that data available has been very attractive for us. Um, so the more recent drive to digitise the collections um, and make that data available to a wider community um, has been one that we've really um, grasped the challenge and tried to do what we can there. So essentially, we, our specimens, we don't have a catalogue of our collections. We never made a complete catalogue of collections on, on paper, on analogue. Um, so when we want to find a specimen, we have to go to the cabinet. That's the only way we know what, what we've got. The, the benefit of that is that we're getting really nice surprises as we go through the collections. 
which is fantastic. Um, so I think last year we found another Darwin specimen um, just by chance, someone going through the collections, and that was our, the first one that we've got from the Galapagos. So that was an exciting moment for us. But we still will have more Darwin specimens. We still will have more Cook, Franklin, you know, all these really um, exciting specimens will still be in there. And we're still finding them, which is great. Um, so when we first started databasing, and we started databasing our specimens quite early on, um, the, there was a feeling that we had to capture all of the information that was on the label. We had to do it properly. If we're doing it, we have to do it properly, capture all the information. So over time, um, when I first started working there about 10 years ago, we, we da basically databased about 10% of our collections. So we then had to shift gear and do this more rapidly um, and looking at large-scale digitization. And one of the things that we, we did when we were looking at ramping up is look at what we were, the data we were capturing. So we decided to drop this right down to very minimal data and do a kind of batch processing. So we developed a, a very fast method of capturing this minimal data, um, which has allowed us to really um, do this minimal data entry to stub record for a large number of our collections. So we've now databased um, about um, 800,000 records, but 26% of the collections. And these records um, are now available on our Herbarium catalogue, it's our online um, resource. And the data can be freely downloaded um, around the world by anyone who wants to go onto our catalogue. Um, in addition to those database records, we've now imaged about 360,000 of our specimens as well. So this has been allowing us to, to get through quite large numbers. Um, we do image the, the, the records quite high resolution. Um, and we're finding that these are being used. So last year, um, about half a million of the records were downloaded by researchers around the world. Um, and about 130,000 images were downloaded. So given that there's obviously a need for these, people are using them, um, we need to find ways to get the data to them as, as quickly as possible, um, bearing in mind that a large number of these obviously have very little data attached to them. So they can download the images at a range of resolution. Um, so this is one of our specimens uh, here. <laughs> Um, and the highest resolution that we, um, we um, allow people to download is, is this full, full resolution CIF image. Um, so people can download that one at a time because it's, it's quite high bandwidth. Um, but um, it's about 175 megabytes is, is what we're talking about. Um, so then we look at basically how we did constructed the, the workflows and the processes for us to be able to do this. And that's part of what I want to talk about today. And we built a, an image workflow um, to allow us to manage the system and to try and automate as much of the system as possible because we're the same as everyone else here. We're limited resources, limited staff time. We need to try and make things as efficient as possible. So we also have had many different digitization projects over over the years and we were in a situation where each of these projects we tended to have a slightly different workflow a slightly different process to <coughs> to manage them so the one thing we did do is we brought all of these together into a single workflow um, to make it more straightforward and we also um, created a large uh, level of automation in that workflow as well um, and that was help to reduce the manual input and, um, and also reduce errors. So the, the system that we use, we serve the, um, we create child images and we serve those up online. Um, we use Zoomify, Zoomify software. Um, the TIFF and the raw images, we keep both the raw and the TIFF images and we, we um, zip them up and store them um, offline on tape um, with two backup copies on tape and one on an external hard drive within the herbarium so we have access to that. Um, and this essentially gives us a finished process of 
um, minimally database records with an image um, and so in order to attach more data to those records um, we're looking at a range of options and as part of that process we're working with a group of other institutes around Europe and as part of a European funded project called Synthesis um, it's a synthesis of systematic resources um, so I'm just trying to make sure it's actually one of the images that's clicked with a transfer. Um, so this project has got several parts to the project, but one part that we are particularly um, involved in is looking at automating the data capture from um, specimens, from collections. And as part of that, we've been um, developing innovative software for image segmentation. So a lot of the images that natural history collections are working with might be, for example, insect drawers. So if an, uh, an image is taken of a whole drawer, then the image is then automatically segmented into the different elements with uh, one insect per image. And that work is being done by the Natural History Museum in London, um, being led by them. We've also been looking at testing their OCR software and developing workflows for OCR um, use and the OCR output. Um, we've been trialling the use of handwritten text recognition and we've been reviewing some of the portals and try, trying some of the portals for parsing OCR text output. Um, we've also been developing tools for image analysis of colour and shape. So there's a few different things that have been exploring. Um, but really what I'm concentrating on today is looking at the, the use of OCR and the, the trying out the HDR for increasing the speed of the data capture of specimens. So first of all, with the, with the OCR, um, so we, we routinely process all our images through OCR software. We, we use the um, Abbey um, recognition server OCR software. And interestingly, um, being here with this library, one of the reasons we're using that is going to an early OCR workshop in, in Wales and um, being told that the British Library tested all the OCR software and they decided that the, the best one was the, the Abbey. So we, we believed them, we went for it. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have done more tests and we're still finding that it's, it's up there. So um, that was a good investment, we feel. And we've been using it for several years now. Um, so what this does is it essentially gives us unparsed text output and we just store that unparsed text in our, in our database. And it was interesting when we, there's been a lot of discussion in, in my community with looking at the use of OCR. And when it first started being used, there was a, a strong feeling that it had to do everything. It had to be able to take the output, parse it into uh, the data database to be useful. And when it didn't do that, and when that was seen as more difficult, um, everyone seemed to stop, use stop using it and stop trying to use it. Um, and what we're doing now, and people are starting to come, come on board, is showing people all the stuff you can do, even without parsing it into a database, even just using the, the kind of raw text output. There's so much that you can do, and it's so useful. And it's, so that's one thing we've been um, trying to do, along with iBigBio, which are the big digitization projects in the US, looking at digitizing their national collections. Um, and people are starting to come on board and we're seeing the use of OCR um, expanding out now, which is, which is great to see. So what we do use the OCR output for, even without parsing it, is we, we um, use it to sort and filter our images to allow people um, to then add data by using the images and manually transcribing the label data. But by sorting and filtering the images first, people are working with collections all by one collector or all from one country. Or and it, what we found is that that allows people to do is get familiar with any handwriting that's appearing on the specimens. It gets people familiar with, with place names and the rate of transcription goes up 
rapidly. And people enjoy it more. They feel, um, they feel more satisfied. They feel that they're actually getting to know either a particular collector or where they were going. They get a kind of personal connection with the collector or with the place. Um, so you get more satisfaction from the people doing the transcription as well. So we've found it really increases efficiency um, and we've added data to over 100,000 specimens in these pre-sorted batches. Um, the idea of sorting label type by uncertainty is um, something we've been looking at, we've not yet ma achieved, but the idea of building different pipelines, um, so sending all the typewritten um, images down one pipeline for people to uh, to um, transcribe um, using some of the OCR, or whether to send it into some handwritten text recognition software, if it's considered to be handwriting. So there's there's potential there, but we've not really um, successfully achieved yet. So as part of the process, we did explore the data um, and partly to find useful search terms. For, for pulling up and creating these batches for people to work with. Um, and what was really interesting with doing that is it, it gave us things that we wouldn't have found otherwise. Um, when you start exploring data, you, you're actually finding things that you might not you might not realise that would be helpful. So a lot of the this one collector that we had um, was a chap called Peter Davis. Uh, he collected about seventy thousand specimens. Um, a lot of those are handwritten, um, so it's quite difficult to pull them all out. But we did discover that he used uh, his, his labels were printed, pre-printed, and it had a printed mark on it. So on here, down at the bottom, you'll see um, a G67. And anything with G67, we know, was a specimen collected by Peter Davis, because that was his printed mark on his label. So some of the things you discover when you start exploring data, and you find ways of pulling out a all the ones from a particular collector, in, in a lot of different ways. It's kind of like a bit like black art, I think, um, of, of OCR. Uh, we also found misspellings. So when we're looking for all the um, specimens <coughs> collected in Turkey, for example, um, we having explored the data, we knew to look for Turkey. We also knew to look for Berkey uh, with a B, because it's sometimes picking up the, the mis misreading the text. Um, so these misspellings were also another way of pulling out, and it's only by exploring data that you find these. So then we started looking at our handwritten labels, um, which aren't suitable for your standard um, OCR process. And this is the point at which we contacted um, Transcriptorium, um, um, which, was, which was great. I mean, it was, uh, that was a really nice um, link between our collections. And I think they were probably interested in our collections because they'd probably not seen anything quite like this before, something out of the ordinary. Um, so our collection, RBG, holds um, collections collected by a particular collector called George Forrest, who was a great plant hunter, brought back a lot of plants that are now growing in people's gardens. Um, and he collected about 30,000 specimens, mostly um, in China, um, and sort of Tibet, Northwest Burma, that kind of area. And most of the earlier specimens were handwritten. His, his writing was actually quite good. Um, there's certain good things that we discovered going through this process about his writing. Um, but a lot of the, um, the specimens have actually al already been databased. So we were starting with something that already existed. And we built a training set using these. So we'd, um, we'd databased about, I think it's about 9,000, 8,000, 9,000 of these already, so about a third of them really. Um, we then um, looked at um, marking up an additional set and transcribing them um, using um, Transcribus. And that was where the, the, the fact that he writes, um, his, his writing is very Especially very straight, really nice to mark up um, as opposed to people who write all over the place. Um, so we, we marked up these and we um, transcribed them to build this additional set. 
And then we ran the, the HTR process on the specimens which had been imaged but not yet um, databased. And the nice thing there is that you'll see on the uh, label um, his name, George Forrest, is printed. So we were able to use the OCR to pull out all the George Forrest specimens, even though we couldn't read the rest of it, and put them into the, into the, um, the handwritten text recognition tool. So that was quite a, a useful joint joining of the two techniques. So the results, um, the results were variable, but um, they actually felt quite promising. Um, so you can see here, this was um, the kind of results that we were getting. So it's, it's definitely recognizing some of the, some of the text. And, and that was really, that was, and just to em emphasize it also that this is, this is the early version. So this is the, the Markov model. Um, so this isn't using the neural networks that are in place now. Um, and this was, um, this was, for us, promising enough to think, well, actually this is worth persevering. This is, we could get something out of this. Um, so I then but, um, also thought about well, what the text that we're trying to read, what, what are the words in there? And I think this is also relevant because when we looked at other material, um, this became more relevant. Um, so the 30,000 specimens collected by George Forrest, so we've databased nearly 10,000 of these. Um, and it was when we were transcribing them um, that we found that, really uh, realized just how limited a vocabulary he was using for those labels. So um, removing these re uh, records, you can see that uh, obviously Forrest occurs a lot, his name. But um, the word shrub, so he collected a lot of shrubs um, and he collected a lot in the um, Salwin Divide region. Um, he was in a lot of thickets and <laughs> he was collecting a lot of uh, pale rose or crimson as well um, flowers. He tended to use similar words um, all the time. So he would, he would stick with a very limited vocabulary. We've not yet counted the num total number of words that he used in those specimens. It's something we're going to look at just to look at the kind of um, size of vocabulary used by different collectors, which I think would be, would be a really interesting area of research. Um, so when you explore these, it just gives you an idea of the kinds of um, words that he was, he was using. Um, also, it gives you an indication of the places he was going and when he was collecting as well. So... Um, so just to say, we've also got um, correspondence by George Forrest. Um, and we were interested to see, having trained it up on his, on his, um, on his handwriting, etc., we could um, presumably use it for his letters. Not really. Um, you'll see here that uh, it's getting some of the words, which was actually, I was quite surprised at how, in some ways, how well it did. But it's also bringing a lot of his limited vocabulary which he was using for plant labels, he's bring, they're bringing that into his, his correspondence, which is not really um, relevant, especially when he's, um, he's got letters to his wife as well, and it was really not, not so relevant. So I think that's, that's for a learning process for us, is that there's different vocabularies that people are being using in different situations, and we need to take that into account. So it's maybe one collector, but we need to think about what collection we're looking at um, when we're looking at these tools. So um, I'm just going to wrap up there. I think um, it's definitely something we're, we're going to follow up on. It's definitely something we're really interested in. There's a lot of handwritten uh, text in our collection. And I think this is an area that would be extremely useful for us. And yeah, thanks, to, thanks very much to the Transcriptorium team. <laughs> okay, thank you.